Here is the old glazing area at my work studio. Through the magic of sketching, 3D modeling, woodworking, and painting, I'll show you how I transform this glazing area catastrophe into a glazing oasis. Right off the bat, I'll start by saying I'm not a master woodworker. I wouldn't even call myself an accomplished woodworker, but I am handy, I like to problem solve, and I've used a fair amount of tools and built a fair amount of things. That being said, it's difficult for me to plan for dimensions of wood projects because of the thickness of the wood. I went through a couple versions of this design and I wanted to walk you through why this design came to be. I had a few deal breakers and parameters that had to be a part of the design. And after those were decided, it pretty much forced me to design this table with very specific dimensions. First things first, I knew I wanted to have a table with holes at the top so the glaze buckets could sink down into, therefore reducing the overall height of the glaze table. Secondly, I wanted to have storage below that other buckets could fit for other glazes or for refilling the glazes that were hanging above. It had to have casters or some kind of mobility without adding too much to the overall height. And it had to be less than 32 and a half inches wide in case I had to get it out of the room to paint or for some other reason. I started with a table that fit eight buckets. And as I got further along in the design, I realized that if buckets are full of glaze, they're at least 50 pounds. And if I have eight buckets above and eight buckets below, that could be upwards of 800 pounds of just glaze plus the weight of the wood. Casters that can support 1,000 pounds become very specialized and expensive. And then I also started questioning if my construction was safe enough for students to use. So right after finishing my eight bucket design, I shrunk the design down to six buckets. In doing so, I realized that I can squeeze this table into a 48 inch dimension. Plywood comes in four by eight foot sheets and so this allowed me to save money on plywood because I was able to get the top and the bottom piece out of one four by eight sheet. So with the top piece being limited to 48 by 32 and a half, it made a tight squeeze for all six buckets to fit while being supported by cross beams of wood below. That parameter came to be through this design process and I wouldn't have gotten this far without many headaches and lots of useless wood if I hadn't done all of this in Tinkercad. If you haven't used Tinkercad, it's a 3D modeling program that's free for anybody. I've used it for small 3D printing projects for my own reasons or for classes or for whatever. However, I've also found it useful for designing things in a faster amount of time. I would have built an eight bucket table had I not tried this design first. After seeing it, I had second thoughts. I made the six bucket design. I was able to work with the dimensions properly, see if the buckets would fit and see the finished cart before even building it. Furthermore, once I was done designing, I literally took every piece of wood out, organized it, and there I had a final cut list for all of the pieces. I'm used to this program. There is a bit of a learning curve. This program saved me hours of my time in the end, and probably a good chunk of money in potential wasted materials. I used a chop saw for cutting all the two by fours down and the posts, and then I used a jigsaw for every other cut, and then a drill for everything else. I started with the top frame, butting up the ends together, and using long deck screws to screw the frame together. Aside from the lumber, I picked up a five pound box of three and a half inch deck screws, which I used about half, and some general two inch construction screws. Four casters capable of supporting 250 pounds a piece, and some four by quarter inch power lag screws with a hex head for attaching the casters to the posts. You'll notice I'm using two by fours for the end and then one by fours for the sides. I would have used two by fours for all of it, but this table design was so jam packed and the buckets had to clear the frames below and the posts on the side that it required me using one by fours to fit the buckets with space in between on the top. After the top frame was finished, I put the posts in place and I started to map out where to put all the cross framing in for the buckets. I hadn't done this before, but I decided to do what's called lap joining. Essentially, you cut out half and half, and so the pieces overlap and fit flush at the same time. This design was necessary because there wouldn't be enough room for the buckets if these weren't lap joints going all the way across. If I cut them into smaller pieces and staggered them, the buckets wouldn't fit. 
I hadn't done this before, but it worked quite well. I shot a screw in from top and bottom to make sure they were tight together. And then on the ends, I used the deck screws one more time to tie this whole top frame structure together. Worked out pretty well, I'm surprised. Next was the posts. Making sure they were flat on the ground and pressing down the frame to make sure it was all flush to the ground, I shot four screws through the top frame into each post. I made sure to stagger the screws so that the ones that were adjacent wouldn't hit the others when I drilled them in. I was skeptical of the strength of the top frame with the lap joints, and so in being me, I climbed on top of the table, gave a little bit of a hop, which is 170 plus jumping, and it supported it quite well. Once the plywood's on, that'd be a lot stronger. I cut all the wood myself except for the plywood. If I had a truck, I would have cut it myself, but I had to get it from the store in my car to school where I work. To secure the plywood to the top frame, I used those two inch screws every three or so inches. This might seem like overkill, but when it comes to making something for others to use, I always err on the side of caution. If it was just me, I wouldn't care that much, but for students, I wanted to make sure that it was safe. That's all I have time for today. I was hoping to do more, but I gotta cut six holes and then add a lower shelf and the casters at the bottom. So I guess I'll wait till day two. Welcome back to day two. I'm gonna cut some holes on top of this table, then attach the bottom portion, the casters and the wheels, and we'll see if the buckets fit. Thanks for being here. It's good to see you all. The most critical part of this design was making sure there were room for all six buckets and then measuring and cutting those bucket holes so that the design would actually work. In order to do this, I measured the circumference of the bucket just below the overhang. And then I used a compass to draw a circle on a piece of paper and cut it out the exact circumference and diameter of the buckets. With this circle, I did some test measurements on the bottom of the table to make sure it would clear the frame and the posts. Once I had the spot that I wanted, I measured its distance from the edges and transferred those measurements to the top of the table. Once I transferred the measurements to the top, I used a compass to draw a circle, a half inch bit to create a starter hole, and a jigsaw to cut all six circles out. I was nervous about cutting these holes too big, and so for each measurement I erred on the side of less. Even when cutting, I stayed inside the lines just in case. After the first hole was cut, it was a little loose, but it fit pretty good. A little bit of wiggle. The diameter of the overhang is about 12 and a half inches, while the diameter just below the overhang is about 11 and a half. So if you do make some mistakes, there's literally a little bit of wiggle room. Keep in mind, these buckets look straight, but I mean, they do taper a little bit, so, you know. It's much less wiggly down here. So for the following five holes, I cut further inside, and if the bucket didn't fit, then I made sure I cut a little bit extra until it fit snugly. This approach was awesome. If I could go back, I'd cut the first hole smaller, but overall, and with all the screws that I put in, the top of the table feels like one solid piece of wood. After the holes were cut, the next step was to add the bottom shelf for storing extra glaze or other glazes and other glaze materials. This was the most physically demanding part. The legs or posts, while appearing straight, were bowing in all different directions. Those cuts you see were cut flush to fit, but there's a good inch and a half gap between some of the posts and those boards. The first few attachments were easy. But the third and the fourth attachment, because there was so much tension and twisting, I had to use quite a bit of muscle to hold the wood in the exact spot that I needed and then screw it in at the same time. Having a second pair of hands for this would have been way easier. Doing it by myself forced me to be very creative to hold the stubborn wooden place as I screwed it together. So to avoid this issue, if you're working alone, I made a second table, surprise, you'll see it later, and I attached the bottom frame to the posts first, while the posts were freestanding. Then I made the top frame with the plywood attached, 
as a cap. This allowed me to put the cap over the legs and then whatever didn't fit, I was able to push the legs in and the top frame kept all the legs from spreading outward. It saved me lots of frustration the second time around. I test fit to make sure that the bucket and the lid would fit underneath the buckets above and it fit great. Anything I could have lowered the top frame an inch or two. Hey guys, these are my glasses. I don't think I've ever worn them before on video. One thing I forgot was I have one cross brace for that bottom frame, so I'll shoot that in and then I will uh, cut the board and put it on. I may have mismeasured or I may have lost a piece of wood because I didn't have a piece for the center. This could have been a two x four, but I had extra wood from the four x four inch posts. I wasn't sure if I needed one, but with potentially six buckets of glaze below, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't sagging in the middle. I notched a couple of the corners for a flush fit and a bit of overhang for extra storage. And it was time to map out all the screw holes and ultimately attach that shelf to the bottom framework. The casters in the post presented a bit of a challenge because the casters are for four inch posts, but four by four inch posts are really only three and a half inches by three and a half inches. To resolve this issue, I screwed the power lags in on an angle. First drilling pilot holes and then using a three eighth inch drill bit and a drill, to run the power legs into the posts. The angle drilling solved the problem of the caster being a bit wider than the bottom post. A little bit of overhang towards the inside helped support the bottom shelf. The only issue I foresaw happening were if the power legs weren't screwed far enough in, the caster might hit them when twisting and swiveling. This only happened once because I didn't fully screw one of the power legs in. After re-drilling my pilot hole and screwing it in further, and at a different angle, this solved the problem. I'll be honest, when I saw it in its finished wood form, I was stoked, I was beyond excited. So I loaded it up with some buckets to see how it would look. I put some buckets below and some tools that I might use for glazing to see it in its entirety. You'll see me here gesturing where I'm gonna put some triangular gussets for support. I thought I might need them, but after using these tables loaded up with glaze for a few weeks, I realized that I won't. What do you think? The point of all this is one, for storage and efficiency, two, a lower height for shorter kids to glaze. You know, I'm only 5'10", but I have students who are like five foot. And also, with glazes against the wall, you know, like, it just looks so much nicer. I can get my six glazes here and my six glazes here on a table a foot shorter or more and mobile. During this entire design process, I was worried about the strength of this table, mainly for safety. And so I wound up over-engineering, at least to my knowledge, many of the parts of this table. However, I got a chance to test the strength just a couple days after finishing it when I had to transfer thousands of pounds of clay over to the field house to hand out clay kits for students for second semester. In the fall, for all of you who saw the video, I transferred all of my kits to the field house using those tall wear carts. It took me four trips and it was excruciatingly difficult. I had 90 new students for semester two, 60 of which would need a remote clay kit to start the semester. Each kit had 25 pounds of clay plus tools. Do the math, 60 times 25 is 1,500 pounds. I easily transferred all of the clay kits in two trips to the field house. So now that I knew that the cart was safe, it was time to paint it. I went with the flat white. White is great for a studio. It hides dust, it's bright, it adds light to the room. It's never a bad idea for a studio space. One tip I wanted to share with you while we're in the middle of this video is about mixing glazes. I'm fortunate at this school to have a space just for mixing glazes from scratch. You know, I've combed through John Britt's book about cone sticks glazes, the internet, Pinterest, everywhere to find the recipes that we use for the studio. I call it Black Sabbath. One thing I picked up from college that I use now in my studio is having the recipes stuck to the side of the bucket. All of these are handwritten, but I have most of them in a Google Doc ready to print and laminate to stick to the side of a bucket. The last thing that you wanna do when you're running low on a glaze is to dig through a binder or find the recipe that you used in the first place. Having it stuck to the side is a great way to make sure you always have it. 
When I've handwritten these, I always put down the basic 100% formula as well as some other amounts that I use regularly. 100 grams is easy to multiply to 1,000, and having 5,000 grams and 10,000 grams there saves you so much time and hassle when you want to mix up different amounts of your glaze. Right away, I fell in love with this cart. It holds 12 buckets, it's mobile, and just by sheer luck, it wound up being an inch higher than the lip of my whiteboard marker and eraser storage. That was a nice surprise. Like, what an eyesore this is. The problem with my whiteboard is that I could never get to it, or even if I got to it, a quarter of it was blocked by buckets and glaze splatter. It still blocks it a little bit, but now I have all this space. And when I need to, I can unlock the casters, move the car out of the way, walk up to the board, write, move around some magnets, put some posters up, whatever I need to do, then walk away, push the cart back, and lock the casters in place. Even though there's about 500 pounds on this cart, it moves relatively easy. Look at the two side by side, even though I have the other table on top of the first table. I still haven't figured out where to put the tops of the buckets yet. If you have an idea for this, honestly, I could use a few. I've considered zip tying them with a hinge or using a carabiner or, or adding a piece of wood across the middle lengthwise so that the bucket lids can flip up to there. I don't know. I don't have an answer for this other than flipping the bucket on top of the glaze next to it. If I have six kids glazing, there's going to be an issue with the buckets. So if you have an idea, please let me know what you think. I genuinely want ideas from all of you. After seeing the first cart in function, seeing how it took up less space, it was more compact, it was cleaner, it was more organized, and it just looked nicer. I loved this cart so much that I built the second one. After building the second cart, and I was able to condense the second half of the glaze area down to that smaller mobile table size. The two tables plus the kick wheel take up less space than the tables before. There's more room to see the whiteboard, everything is mobile, and everything is off the floor. In a matter of minutes, I can move everything away from the whiteboard. I can pull the buckets out into the center of the room so people can more easily access all the glazes. It just looks nice and it sparks joy in my life, as it will in yours if you make a table similar or just like mine. I've completely transformed the glazing area. It's more functional, it's cleaner, it's nicer looking. It's just better overall across the board. About a week ago, I gave it a test for myself. I mixed up all the glazes since we hadn't used them yet since the start of the semester. And like I expected, the entire experience was more pleasant. I always use a drill with an attachment to mix up glazes from scratch or to mix them when they've been sitting for a while. And to do that, I either have to have an extension cord running across the room, which gets caught sometimes, and it did right here on the first take. When I use an extension cord, I usually have to have a second bucket of water to clean off the drill in between mixing glazes and a sponge to get the spots that I missed. Or, or after mixing, I tilt the drill head up and walk swiftly over to the sink, which usually leads to some drips on the floor. The other option was taking every bucket over to the sink, mixing it there, which was less mess because it was easier to clean off the drill, but then I had to lug every bucket back and forth. When I mixed up these glazes, I was able to wheel the entire table over and rotate it around in between the buckets. I was able to rotate the entire table over to the sink, and after mixing up the first three, I rotated the table 180 degrees and repeated the process. During this entire process, I had a smile on my face for just how easy it was, not just in that moment, but how easy it would be for me for years to come. The second field test was actually glazing. There was plenty of space around the tables. I was able to easily access all 12 glazes in our studio. Again, I don't know where to put all the bucket lids. That is a problem I want to resolve. And if you have an idea, please put it in the comments below. The other question I have is when I'm glazing bigger pieces, where do I put them other than on top of a bucket? If we go back to Tinkercad, you'll see here that I've already designed some kind of shelf that can slide onto the side of the cart for glazing days. Any pot that's more narrow than eight inches can definitely rest on the edge somewhere of the table, but bigger pieces like plates will have to go somewhere. 
they could go on top of a different bucket. Not all buckets are used all the time. But I am curious, do any of you have ideas for an expandable and collapsible attachment for shelving for this glaze cart? I also want to have a space for tongs and underglaze, maybe brushes, or tools we use less often, but we still use for glaze. So while these carts are finished, I don't think they've reached their final form yet. I think they're about 90% of the way there. I love them as they are. But if I can get the entire glaze station mobile besides water, that's what I'm shooting for. I think these carts have a lot of potential. And because they're simple, they can be customized for any specific studio. 